This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Brilliant.org, a problem-solving website that helps you think like an engineer. The sight of a 9.4 ton plane slowly rise off the ground, balancing precariously on four columns of air over the rough water of Gawai Bay, is the closest to sci-fi alien technology I have ever seen in my life. An inspiring sight that seeded an obsession with aviation technology. The Harrier was the culmination of decades of bizarre experimentation to eliminate the plane's greatest weakness, its need for a runway to both land and take off. This fascinating technology has one of the richest histories in aviation, with roots in both the Lunar Lander and outlandish World War II era German sketches. Both the Allies and the Germans used helicopters and autogyros during this period, but using a rotor for both lift and thrust inherently trades off speed. The Germans dreamed of a plane capable of taking off from anywhere, eliminating the need for tactically vulnerable airstrips without sacrificing speed or dogfight capabilities. Inspired by their ballistic missile program, which still lacked effective guidance programs to accurately target Allied aircraft, Eric Bockham developed the tail-sitting, rocket-powered BP-349, which would allow the pilot to take control of the plane in its final stages of flight to guide it to its target and unleash a barrage of smaller rockets before ejecting to safety. The only manned test of this aircraft resulted in the death of the test pilot and the idea was abandoned, but that didn't stop the Germans in their pursuit of VTOL aircraft. Next up was an even more bizarre tail-sitting aircraft that featured three propeller blades, each powered by ram jets at their tips. This would function similar to a helicopter for takeoff and then transition to forward flight and use the blades like a giant propeller. But it would require a nose-up position to achieve adequate lift, as it didn't have any wings. Unsurprisingly, this didn't make it past basic wind tunnel testing, but could well have inspired the Lockheed XFV and Convair XFV Pogo planes in the 1950s, which used massive counter-rotating turbo propellers. The Lockheed version only ever managed to hover for a brief moment while transitioning from a horizontal flight to an upwards vertical flight, but the Convair XFV Pogo, flown by Lieutenant Colonel James Coleman, became the first aircraft in history to successfully fly in both forward aerodynamic flight and in hover. Ultimately, both planes were cancelled due to the difficulty in flying them and their lack of speed and lack of lifting power. Engines for propeller-driven aircraft were simply not powerful enough yet. To achieve necessary lift, the rotors would need to increase velocity or diameter, which would decrease the max horizontal speed of the aircraft as the tip speeds of the blades would rise, meaning the tips of the blades could easily break the sound barrier and cause all kinds of problems. This problem and how the incredibly versatile Osprey solved it needs a video by itself to explain the nuanced design of helicopters and their speed limits, but for now you'll just have to trust me that it's a difficult problem to solve. And with the advent of powerful jet engines, the problem was largely solved without the need for large propellers. The first aircraft to use jet propulsion for vertical takeoff was the Rolls-Royce Thrust Measuring Rig, aptly nicknamed the Flying Bedstead, for its obvious departure from the bird-like designs of the past. This configuration largely influenced the design of the Lunar Lander training vehicle that NASA developed for Neil Armstrong and other astronauts to practice with. They mounted the engine on a large gimbal to ensure the thrust always pointed directly downwards and only provided enough lift to simulate the moon's gravity, while hydrogen peroxide rockets were used for control. Neil Armstrong attributed the success of his difficult landing on the moon to this ingenious training vehicle. The lessons learned through early research aircraft like these provided Rolls-Royce with the knowledge required to develop the Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine, which powers the Harrier. This engine needed to have enough thrust to lift the entire weight of the plane. The designers of the plane made this job easier by utilising carbon fibre composites for much of the aircraft structure to save weight, making the Harrier one of the first planes to use these materials. Yet the job of designing a single engine capable of providing enough vertical thrust was still difficult, and the resulting engine is pretty unique as a result. The engine is similar to a traditional jet engine in that it consists of a low pressure compressor fan, a high pressure compressor, a combustion chamber, a high pressure turbine and a low pressure turbine. Where it differs radically is the engine outlet is not just one large opening but split into four, where the first two nozzles duct some of the air coming from the low pressure compressors and the final two duct air from the higher pressure turbines. Because the air bleeding from the low pressure compressor system has less force than the high pressure nozzles, the low pressure nozzles need to be placed further from the plane's center of gravity than the high pressure nozzles. This balances the plane along the length of the plane, but in vertical takeoff mode there is no air flowing over the wings to provide force for the control surfaces. So the plane needs a way of controlling its roll, pitch and yaw in vertical takeoff mode, and so the plane features nozzles that bleed air from the engine on the nose, tail and wingtips. 
This control system is not as reliable as aerodynamic lift, which is largely self-correcting when disturbances occur, although fighters tend to purposely decrease stability to increase maneuverability, which requires a computer to constantly monitor. But the disturbances due to the ground effect from its own jet can cause oscillations that overwhelm this control system, and with no accurate way of correcting them, they can grow until the plane inverts and lands on the cockpit, which has killed pilots on several occasions. So pilots often drop the plane heavily from a few meters above the ground before the oscillation could take hold, which obviously wasn't ideal for the landing gear. The Harrier was also disadvantaged to conventional aircraft as the vertical takeoff mode was severely limited in max takeoff weight and burnt off much of its fuel in this intensive maneuver, reducing its range too. So most Harrier takeoffs take place only as a partial vertical takeoff, where the plane would accelerate on the runway like a conventional plane to achieve some lift from the wings and then angle the nozzles to achieve the final lift needed to safely take off on the shorter runways of aircraft carriers. The plane could then land vertically without wasting as much fuel later on when the weight of the aircraft had reduced through its use of fuel and armaments. This takes its max takeoff weight from 9.4 metric tons to 14, which is still lackluster when comparing to its fellow marine aircraft like the FA-18 Hornet, which has a max takeoff weight of 23.5 tons and a maximum speed of 1.8 Mach, compared to the Harrier's subsonic 0.9 making it a much more capable attack platform, but the Hornet is only capable of launching from large carriers, whereas the Harrier can launch from amphibious assault ships like the USS America. The Harrier has even managed to land on a cargo ship when its pilot lost radio contact with his crew and ran out of fuel. But both of these fighters are slated to be replaced by the controversial F-35, which will be capable of VTOL thanks to the incredible directional rear thrust and shaft-driven lift fan. This fighter improves much of the technology the Harrier laid the ground for, while including futuristic VR helmets allowing the pilot to see through their own plane using six infrared cameras surrounding the plane, advanced laser targeting and radar capabilities, all the while incorporating stealth technology. The plane has been deeply entrenched in US politics, raking in huge developmental costs and supporting thousands of American jobs. It has been delayed again and again, largely due to its ambitious technological leap over its older counterparts. Should it finally reach service, it will become the most advanced plane in the history of mankind. Each advancement, like this, is built upon the foundations of physics that humankind has learned over the course of our existence. If you would like to flex your physics knowledge and learn more about the principles of the universe upon which these machines are built, I highly suggest you check out Brilliant.org. Brilliant is a problem-solving website that teaches you how to think like an engineer. You can dive in and start learning about a huge range of topics, starting from basic physics and working your way up to more complicated topics. For an example, check out their course on classical mechanics, one of the most important subjects in mechanical engineering. The first 200 people to sign up with this link will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. I get to learn and solve these kind of problems for a living and I love it. It gives me that warm glowy feeling inside when I finally conquer a difficult problem. Actively challenging your brain on a daily basis and getting that endorphin rush of a job well done is great for your mental health. Brilliant even have an app where you can challenge yourself on the go. I have even been guilty of pulling out their puzzle section to challenge my friends while out for a pint. As usual, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. I just uploaded a new episode of Showmakers with special guest Grant from 3Blue1Brown. The link for that is on screen now and the links to all my social media are in the description.